Welcome back to Uncharted X. This is Ben, and I hope you are all doing well. Located alongside the Nile River in Upper Egypt is a vast and ancient structure, filled with mysteries wrought in stone, gigantic artifacts, and clues to the deepest parts of human civilization. Karnak Temple, with its satellite Luxor Temple, is often cited as the largest religious complex in the world, ancient or not. And the fact that even our orthodox dating has it at least 3,000 to 3,500 years old makes this citation that much more remarkable. Yet, there are many clues that can be found here that indicate a potentially far older date for the origins of this complex, along with evidence for a technological paradox, one shared with many Old Kingdom sites like Giza, Saqqara or Abu Sir. The paradox of the oldest stonework being far more sophisticated than latter additions. And, like on Old Kingdom sites, at Karnak we can find the signatures of advanced machining, overcuts into granitic stone, gigantic tubular drills, and monstrously large single-piece artifacts. Further, a potential deep antiquity for some of the infrastructure is hinted at by tremendous levels of erosion and some very strangely affected granite diorite blocks that are literally crumbling apart. Any internet search on the origins of Karnak Temple will tell you that dozens of ancient Egyptian pharaohs left their mark here, with most construction occurring over more than a thousand year period between the 12th and 20th dynasties stretching from the Middle Kingdom to the New Kingdom of Ancient Egypt. Most notably, much of Karnak and Luxor is attributed to a ruler that viewers of this channel should be well familiar with, Ramses II of the 19th Dynasty, as evidenced by his name being deeply carved into many of the walls and artifacts found here. I've covered the issues with this method of dating stonework or artifacts, the problems with the he who wrote on it must have built it approach in several videos on this channel. But even in orthodox history, there is some acknowledgement that Ramses usurped older and superior pieces in his work. In other places on these sites, you can find evidence that the ancient structures we see today have been built over deeper layers of even older architecture mostly hidden now by the renovation work that was conducted in later periods. So I hope you'll join me in this video as we explore many of the mysterious and remarkable attributes of the awe-inspiring ancient sites of Karnak and Luxor temples. Before we dive into the video, I want to quickly mention a couple of upcoming events. There are still a couple of spots available for the soon to be happening Mega Floods of the Ice Age tour of Montana that the Snake Bros and I will be attending, and it'll be led by Randall Carlson and Brad from Cosmographia. It's happening in mid-September 2023, and the link to check it out if you're interested is below in the video description. I'm also happy to announce that I've joined the speaker roster for the upcoming Conference of Precession and Ancient Knowledge, or CPAC, that's held on the 20th to the 22nd of October, 2023 in Palm Springs, California. I'm very much looking forward to this event as I'll be speaking alongside some of my idols, friends and colleagues, people like Graham Hancock, Christopher Dunn, Hugh Newman, Jimmy Corsetti and more. Again, the link for more info is below in the description. Lastly, a reminder that this channel is run on the value for value model. I don't do sponsorships or this video brought to you by today segments. But hey, maybe the 500th email to me from Raid Shadow Legends might eventually do the trick. Who knows? That said, if you do get some value from my work, please do consider returning some of that to me, be it in time, talent, or treasure at whatever level of value seems right to you. You could sign up on Patreon, Subscribestar, or on channel memberships, or you could send me a tip for a coffee, or reach out to me with your talent like Simon Reynolds from createvideo.nz did, and he created my epic new intro video, for which I'm very grateful. There are lots of ways to support the channel and my work. They're all outlined on my website at unchartedx.com support. And as always, many, many sincere thanks to those who do choose to support me. I really couldn't do this work without you. The temples of Karnak and Luxor are but two of the many incredible sites in the antiquity-rich region of the modern city of Luxor, and in fact this city has been built up around these monuments. 
Constructed atop the ancient Egyptian capital known as Thebes, the Luxor region is home to something like a full third of all of the world's antiquities. Situated on the River Nile in Upper Egypt, which is in the south of the country, Luxor is around 400 miles to the south of the Giza Plateau, and about 110 miles north of Aswan, which is the source for much of the granite used in the structures. Luxor today is one of the major tourist hubs in Egypt. It's a busy port for the popular Nile cruises, the launch pad for day trips to Dendera and Abydos, which is the Temple of Seti I, and the mighty Assyrian that's out the back. Across the river from Luxor is the famous West Bank of the Nile, that's home to more ancient sites than I could reasonably mention, but highlights include the Valley of the Kings, the Valley of the Queens, the Ramesseum with its thousand plus ton granite statue, the tombs of the nobles, the temple of Hatshepsut, and the Colossi of Memnon, which guard the gates to the massive temple of Amenhotep III, still a very active archaeological site where they're unearthing more and more giant single piece statues. If you do ever find yourself in Luxor, don't miss the opportunity to take one of the daily hot air balloon flights at dawn over the West Bank. It would be tough to find a more picturesque and beautiful view as the sun rises over the Nile, and you're afforded a unique perspective on the many ancient ruins in this area. Both Karnak and Luxor temples have been known of, visited and written about throughout the ages, but for much of recent millennia they were in a considerable state of disrepair. Before the major excavations and restorations of the 18th and 19th century could begin, the local people living inside the structures had to be removed, as the area had been continuously occupied for many thousands of years. And it turns out that giant stone pylons or columns are fairly handy when it comes to setting up a domicile or for finding a shady spot to tie up your donkey. Early photographs from this time can give us a sense of the scale of restoration work that has been done here, and it's work that continues to this day. Statues are being restored with concrete sculpting, something that I'm 50-50 on if I'm honest, although there's no mistaking the modern work for the hardstone perfection of the ancients. And large blocks of stone are still being moved around, even if we seem to need modern equipment to do it. <laughs> well, no, that's the joke, is that like... We found proof of how they lifted up the yeah, obelisks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. As mentioned, Karnak and Luxor temples are these days inside the modern city of Luxor, but the ancient connection between the two sites has been recently restored. An avenue lined with more than 1,300 sphinxes runs for more than one and a half miles, or around three kilometers, between the two locations, and it was likely originally constructed during the New Kingdom. It's one of many examples of the continuous renovation, repair and expansion work that took place on these sites, not only during the dynastic period, but right through to relatively modern times. The Romans added their marks here. Chambers inside Luxor Temple were converted, plastered over and painted by Coptic Christians, and there is currently still an Islamic mosque built right into the site, with the call to prayer providing a haunting backdrop to the tourists who are visiting the site under the lights. I mention all of this work on the site because it is through this lens of renovation and rework that we must view the evidence that's found here today. I've visited Karnak and Luxor multiple times at this point, they're both absolute highlights for any trip to Egypt, but they're vast complexes, particularly Karnak at a massive 200 acres, and it's impossible to take it all in on a single visit. What's more, there is tremendous nuance and detail to be found here, 
And rather than try and cover everything in a single video, I want to share with you some of the most interesting aspects that I've found on these ancient sites in my time here. Overall, there is an interesting juxtaposition of ancient technology on these sites. Both temples feature what I would call a granite core, central structures and artifacts made from megalithic blocks of very hard stone that in several locations display the telltale signs of advanced machining techniques. Around these granitic cores, the majority of the stonework this is the mighty pylons and the hyperstyle halls, is all comprised of sandstone, which is a substance that is far, far softer than granite and much easier to work. This really doesn't deter from their scale and majesty, however. Walking around inside the great halls of Karnak or Luxor is an experience like no other, with their soaring heights and beautiful inscriptions, some even with colour still visible after so many thousands of years. These parts of Karnak and Luxor are, in my opinion, unquestionably spectacular achievements by the dynastic civilizations of the Middle and New Kingdom. But is it possible that they were constructed around or even over a pre-existing infrastructure? Despite the attribution of the temples to the Middle and New Kingdom, there are, in a few places, the names of Old Kingdom pharaohs written here. So it seems likely that there was something here in the early times of the dynastic civilization. Much of the granitic work in the core of the sites matches architectural styles found on Old Kingdom sites like Giza or Saqqara. Even the obelisks, which are often and incorrectly thought to be solely the product of the New Kingdom, are connected to the Great Pyramids with their Benben stones. And historically, the oldest and largest known standing obelisk was that at Abu Ghraib, a 5th dynasty sun temple of the Old Kingdom. Today, only the pedestal for this obelisk remains, but it's a huge platform that is sometimes mistaken for a broken down pyramid, and it gives a sense of scale for just how massive this obelisk truly was. Perhaps the best demonstration of the significant technological delta found at Karnak and Luxor can be given by an examination of the columns. The huge sandstone columns are no doubt impressive, and evidence for their method of construction can be found just inside the first pylon or gate at Karnak. Here we can see an unfinished column, still rough on the outside, showing just how the final product was achieved. Sandstone blocks are piled up and then shaped and shaved down to give them their distinctive form. As large as they are, the effort and technology required to make one of these is a world apart from that required to make a single piece monolithic granite column. That's not to mention that the granite had to be shipped into the site from over 100 miles away, while the source for the sandstone was relatively local. Several of these monolithic granite columns can still be found in a central structure at Luxor. See the granite pillars? All granite oh, pillars, yeah. and then these are sandstone. Oh. Stacked, stacked sandstone rounds. So older and then... Right, so these are trying to replicate right. probably these older pillars here. And the whole thing's granite here in the center too. I think these statues in particular were here, if not, and maybe they moved or this temple was built around them by, and then dedicated to Ramses. Yeah. Um, you have the same thing, these columns, these single piece granite columns. Yeah, See, and this is, uh, you know, Yusuf would call this most likely uh, pre-dynastic pyramid builder culture. See, and these columns, are, this, this stuff is likely uh, Ramses and, and okay. um, dynastic, but you have a mix here. It's, an, yeah, it's, a, it's a real mix, where they've inherited stuff and Ramses has written his name on these statues. They're marvels of stonework, complete with, let's just say, some very rough inscriptions, but it's even acknowledged that these were likely reused by Ramses II and were in fact much older when his men worked on this site. In my recent presentation video, The Tale of Two Industries, I showed how across multiple types of artifacts, there exists both a sophisticated and a relatively primitive industry or method of manufacturing and stonework. From vases to boxes, slabs, columns, even pyramids, reverence and imitation seem to have been key drivers for the primitive industry, 
work that was done perhaps with an intent to capture some of the significance or power of the more remarkable and older artifacts. When you compare the shape and the form of the granite column at Luxor to the sandstone example that's right next to it, you can clearly see the same principles of imitation and reverence in action. Although they're larger, these sandstone columns are, at least to my eye, obvious imitations of the amazing and older monolithic works of granite. And these are almost certainly much older. While sandstone columns like these pretty much are restricted to the works of the New Kingdom, the perfectly formed huge single-piece granite columns go all the way back to the very oldest of sites, which originally contained dozens of them. Examples of these types of columns from Old Kingdom sites like Saqqara or Giza can be found in the Cairo Museum, or there's some examples in the British Museum, and all of these are pretty much unadorned with any inscription. Yet more of these columns can be found on a visit to Islamic Cairo, which has many granite columns that were sourced from the Old Kingdom sites around the city, and then later reused in mosques. The remnants for a veritable forest of monolithic granite columns can similarly be found at Tanis in the north in the delta, and I take any chance that I can get to share the very best example of one of these that I've ever seen. It's the flared end piece from a huge granite column, and it's found at another site in the delta, the temple of Bastet. My goodness, to find some results like this in a granite stone. I will do a video specifically on columns and obelisks in the near future. It's something that I've been wanting to do for a while. I've also heard some outright fabrications from certain channels who seem to like making videos about my work, claiming that I think that the Roman columns of the Pantheon were Egyptian. I can't say I'm surprised at being misrepresented yet again, it's kind of old hat at this point, but hey, maybe they are mind readers. If so, I think they need their magic crystal ball of what I think tuned up a little bit, because although the granite is certainly sourced from Aswan, these columns were shaped by the Romans. And believe me when I say there's a world of difference between these columns, which are imprecise and tapered from the bottom to the top, when they're compared to the perfectly made and flared examples that we can find in ancient Egypt. And that's a difference I'll explore in that video. However, it's not just round granite columns that are found at Karnak, but also square granite pillars, which are similar to those found in the Valley Temple at Giza, or like those in the Osirion at Abydos. These pieces at Karnak are utterly remarkable, with stunning lotus and palm high-relief carvings on them. On the pillars at Karnak, there are low-relief carvings on the side, but above the lotus flower, we can see high-relief hieroglyphic carvings. While these are unquestionably of a high quality, as with many of the glyphs that can be found at Karnak, they're still the result of hand tools and chisels. If you look closely at these glyphs, particularly looking at this corner or this line here, you can see that the carving is actually inset into the stone. It's not raised up higher than the base surface of the pillar as the lotus carving is. So if this was originally a flat surface above the lotus flower, all that's required is to carve the negative space away, and voila, there are your high relief glyphs. This technique reminds me of one of my videos on the subterranean resonance chambers at the Giza Plateau, where the same technique of carving high relief figures that are inset into the wall was used. The other thing which we can believe is this chamber could exist an older era and then reused as tomb later from a, a stone carver point of view. Yeah, the statues are in yeah. carpet. That's relief. Yes, yeah. yes, and that's something can be added later. Yeah. But if you are working in one like community and you are going to repair statues, then you would usually leave these Out. relief. It's also less in the work on carving the chain. If we're gonna work if we're gonna think normally. Right. Yeah. yeah. This is more work. Yeah. And the fact that between the middle pyramid and the third pyramid, there are plenty of chambers with no decorations, just the chamber and, and the shelf. Flat wall. Yeah. yeah. So repurposed as a tomb, this was later, you think? Mm-hmm. Was this ever repurposed as a tomb? It, it's it definitely known as a tomb. 
what we are saying, what are, what are we saying, that it's possible that it was not a tofu yeah. before. It was something like the Ozerian shaft, which also officially they believe it's a symbolic tomb. But let's not go to the official explanation because there is no evidence to prove this. But the fact is, they are underground tunnels and wells and chambers that is connected to the middle pyramid structure, not separate from. So, if this, if based on that example and others, we can take these that many of these chambers, rock cut chambers underground, are originally part of the pyramid complex, not separated from it, but reused later as burials. It's a possibility in my opinion. Yeah. We can't say when this work was done, but it would be hard to definitively claim that the statues found here are contemporary with the original work of carving out the chamber, as all you'd need to do this is a flat wall to carve the negative space away. And likewise, in the case of the pillar at Karnak, all you would need is the flat surface of stone. Still, it's amazing work, and I've always maintained that the carving of the hieroglyphic language became a high art form in ancient Egypt as it unquestionably was during the New Kingdom. And we see the results of that in the amazing glyphs that are written at Karnak. All that said, so far as I've seen, there is nothing in any of these high-quality writings that are found on obelisks or the other artefacts that precludes them from being achieved with flint hand tools. If you take a close look into any of the corners of these carved glyphs, it'll still reveal the telltale signs of chiseling. In many of my other videos, we've explored the technological depth involved in creating the granite structures and artifacts that come from the oldest times of civilization. And we've explored how their construction really wasn't achievable with the tools and techniques known to have been used during these times. This conclusion is just one of many that leads us to the potential for a longer history of civilization and the possibility of inheritance, relabeling and reuse playing a large role in the establishment of the Old Kingdom. I think aspects of the stonework at Karnak and Luxor may well fit this category and what's more there is quite a bit of evidence for a very ancient past here. In a tucked away corner of the Great Hall at Karnak, near the granite core of the site, floor tiles have been removed to show a deeper and older layer. What we're seeing below the level of the existing hall is the base for a column, but it's not made from sandstone like all of the others. Rather, it's made from white calcite or alabaster. Quite clearly, before the Great Sandstone Hall of the New Kingdom was erected, there was another set of columns here. Close to this location, in the area around the obelisk, we can find more of these alabaster bases. It's evident that they're not coordinated with or part of the current hyperstyle hall. The material used here is also a clue, as white calcite bases were often combined with single-piece granite columns. We also know that these alabaster bases were in use from the earliest times and were even recycled or repurposed as early as the 5th dynasty. I have a video on the Old Kingdom recycling of stone that shows an example of a reused alabaster column base at Giza which was quarried and converted into an offering table. Here we are in the 1st dynasty tomb of Ra'wer and it was excavated by the Professor Selim Hassan. We can see over there his offering hall. And we can see in this offering hall, if we look over here, the offering tables that he used. Well, of course, the stone machinery here is reflecting definitely the capability of the first dynasty. But the stones here, huh? we have this one over here. It's a pillar base, yeah. This was his offering hall, and this, as we can see here, was one of the offering tables. But the Professor Selim Hassan mentions that this is a very odd shape for an offering table, because we are never used to see them around like this. I recognize this very well. This is a base of a pillar, yeah. and obviously it was being reused in this structure here. So the base of the pillar will be from this part lower underground and only this part will be above the ground 
and then the pillar was going to be mm. on top of it. That's a base of a, this is an evidence of recycling. Here also, uh, to give you more evidence, here you can see that this is perfectly round. Okay, you see that? Here we can see the, another base of a pillar that was used also as an offering table. But look here, the circle is not complete. Is it clear? It is clear. Yeah, that the circle it, here it. Yeah. was carved. Why? To put the depiction mm. of the priest. And we can see here the inscription and his name down here. Ra, well, this is the priest from the first dynasty. Fourth dynasty. Yes. Yeah. So here we have a conclusive evidence that shows that stone was being recycled since the old kingdom yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. It begs the question, just how old might these be if they're already being quarried and recycled in the Old Kingdom? There is another and much more quantifiable indicator of significant age for some of the work here, and it's something I only just became aware of on my most recent visit to Karnak, having walked past it many times in the past. Towards the back of the complex, out in what is now an open area, are several rose granite blocks that have been severely eroded. In fact, at this point, they almost look like unfinished raw granite. These were originally finished pieces, likely flat with square corners, perhaps only a small fragment of what might once have been a structure here in this spot. You can even find evidence for stone joinery, the bow tie method of connecting pieces together or for repairing cracks. The granite today is literally crumbling and falling apart from exposure and erosion. When I first posted images of these stones on social media, their poor condition caused someone to respond that it wasn't even granite, which it most definitely is, likely sourced from Aswan. It takes a very long time for this sort of erosion to occur in stone like this naturally. On my last trip to Karnak, we happened to have a qualified geologist along with us, Chuck Kinzer, who discussed the granite that's found here. In this case, this could have had sharp corners like the piece above, right? by Brian's elbow. But you notice the corners wear first. It's not from knocking them on something, it's because it's got the, so the most surface area, right? So that very tiny corner is easy to erode, and then it goes and goes. Eventually this will end up round. Okay. So another thing is the minerals degrade at different rates. So this this pink is a orthoclase feldspar, right? So it it, it will degrade more than the faster than the quartz that's in this. Granite has five different minerals and certain percentages and whatnot. And you'll you'll see that. So any of these rocks that are kind of crumbly like this, see it, look, right? That's just weathering. And um, <laughs> so, so that's what you're seeing here. To get that to happen, and this is a, this bow tie, that's what I was talking about over here. This is, this was made either, there, there could have been a crack or they put something here, they were tying something to it, but those bow tie shapes are common even today. Um, but this, and I, I think the pieces on top, they could have been doing something. Someone could have been making their cereal up there. I don't know. Who knows? Yeah. But not really. And so, yeah, yeah. but when you see this weather, you could do it two different, <laughs> you could do it two different ways. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be, it'll be from long time weathering, right? You, you go to state parks, things like that. Those rocks have been exposed for hundreds of thousands of years. They don't even look this bad sometimes. But they're out in the weather, they dry out. This thing was probably wet for a while or there was a fire around it. And if you think about it, just like to heat something up and cool it down, it can break and it works over the edges. So I don't know, but, but this being a big piece like this laying around, uh, that thing was shaped a long time ago. And, and to do that, I mean, that's not gonna happen in 10,000 years. 50? 50 years? How hot 50, of a fire? 50 this. I know. <laughs> How hot of a fire? It could be longer than that. Yeah. Like, can you do this with campfires? Or? Yeah. Okay. But, yeah, it's only the, a campfire but over and over and over and over. But only the surface, like, like it's only not going to penetrate. Only the surface is going to go, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and so, but this to me looks like this has been soaking in water a little bit, too. Mm. So, yeah. um, but again, those, those feldspires are going to kind of fall apart first, first right? Yeah. And then they take the rest with it. Yeah. Chuck, um, what about what about the minerals that would be washed up with the floods? Some of some of the 
deposits. Still. Still. Yeah. Still. It's on it. Yeah. If it is, is that going to have help? Oh, would it? If own? it was acidic, yes, it would. Yeah. But I don't know. There's so much limestone around here, it's well, not acidic yeah. because the limestone would be gone. Yeah. yeah, this is an alkaline soil. Yeah. Huh. So that's that's what I think about this. When we walked by it, I mean, it was it's clearly something to pay attention to. Um, that's that, that's you know as much of an expert I could be in 20 minutes. Cheers. <laughs> Erosion on granite that wouldn't happen in 10,000 years isn't the only strange condition found on hard stone at Karnak. Something far more mysterious is going on in a normally off-limits area of the temple, in a tucked away alcove that's part of the granitic core of the site. The dark coloured granite diorite here has undergone some sort of transformation, at least that's the best way that I can describe it. The surface of the intact pieces are cracked, as if it suffered from some sort of immense pressure from the inside of the stone. Further into the alcove we can observe some broken pieces of the same material, and something very interesting seems to have occurred. The outer layer, or the outer couple of inches of the stone, seems to be intact, but it's as if the inside of the material has degenerated, perhaps swelling in the process, and causing the pieces to then crack and break. I don't really know how to explain it, and over the years my good friend Yusuf Awen has consulted several expert geologists about the condition of this stone, none of whom have been able to explain what's happened here. It's not geopolymer, although I await the inevitable comments claiming otherwise. If I've learned one thing in the last few years, it's that it doesn't matter how many times I explain the evidence or legitimate reasons that geopolymer is a silly theory, particularly when it comes to granite or other igneous rock, some folks are just entirely married to the idea. Just send me a bag of it and we'll start a landscaping empire, I promise. Literally, the core of this granitic formation became falling apart, crumbling. And the surface is still solid. So, until, until now, as I mentioned for you earlier, this became a very confusing transformation of the stone for geologists, not anybody. So Robert Chuck, I was here with him and I showed this for him. And I played one of the tours that he was on. And also our teacher, ge geologist Susan Moore and the Kemet School. And it's mysterious. They both said, I don't know. And I still don't know. But Robert Chuck was not convinced the, the minerals of the stones will be extended just from moving the stone from one location to the next. And yeah. it's here where we want to go because we're waiting for this other guy. Huh? You see now these cracks? Hmm? Because that expand that huh? happened in the core of the stone when the minerals of it extend. This is what caused this crash. It's not geopolymer. <laughs> it's not the effect of something that was molded. But look here. Here is the material itself. This is the stuff that is in the, in the core. This is the type of granite that you see in the core inside. See that? Crystallized. Crumbles. Yeah. Crumbalized. And this is the formation, how it looks. So we can see almost even thick layer of the stone in a good condition. And then the core is the part that somehow, or because of that mineral extent, the structure of it changed and became crumbling like this. In, in your opinion or Susan's opinion on how that can happen with that particular we don't stone? Know. We don't know. She's investigating this and I just asked her last week, any more information about the granite that I write? She said the more I investigate, the more it becomes confusing. Crazy. This is what but she I, said. But I've, I've seen this in the, in the mountains. I've seen stone yes. like that falling apart in the mountains. In Me the too. mountains, high in the mountains. Me too. Right. But this would usually be here on the surface. Right. And the core will be the solid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Right, right. Yes. Here it's the opposite. The core is crumbling under the surface is solid. Hmm. Like inside, this inside crumbling outside. one is inside this cracked one. The outside in, 
Exactly. That's why it's confusing. We understand how the stone can deteriorate and crumble from the surface. That's the normal thing. But what we don't understand is how it can crumble in the inside and stay solid in the, on the outside. So this extended and this is what caused these cracks. cracks. But this is solid. This is the part that crumbles. It cracked because of the extent of minerals that happened in the core. Which shows as well that this transformation happened after the stone was shaped. Some unknown process has transformed the hard stone in this part of the temple. And this happened after the blocks were cut. It's literally crumbling apart. I really don't have an explanation for it, but I can draw a comparison to some other examples of crumbling stone. Again, something that happened to it after the stone was cut. There are basalt blocks on sites like Abu Sir that were once cased in limestone, and that is now crumbling. Perhaps what we're seeing here now is a hint to some hidden and lost but original functional purpose for this area of the site. Karnak Temple also displays some of the most interesting evidence for stone cutting and machining that you can find anywhere in Egypt. If you've seen my videos on these topics before, you'll know that there's a real problem with trying to explain the signatures in the stone with the tools and techniques that we know the dynastic Egyptians used. These are generally limited to pounding stones, flint or other hard stone chisels, and grinding techniques that use sand with copper, stone, or maybe even horn implements. With these tools alone, we're expected to believe that the mighty and perfectly shaped hard stone architecture and artifacts of places like Karnak and the Old Kingdom were formed. There are, however, a few spots at Karnak that display tool marks that absolutely cannot be explained via any of these primitive methods. On a section of an obelisk, again in the granitic core of the site, we can find several narrow overcuts. What's more, these overcuts begin shallow, they get deeper, and then they become shallow again, a clear indication for a powerful circular tool being used to cut into the granite. These tools were probably used as part of removing more stone above the level of the surface that we currently see, and we're just seeing the signature for the very end or the very tip of the tool, after most of the stone that it cut through was removed. At the lower end of this cut, there's also evidence for a reset of the tool. Perhaps it was slightly offline or off-center, and then it was reset. But in any case, this looks like something very powerful that was removing stone rapidly, and it left a slight overcut. More overcuts can be found in the white calcite of the so-called chapels that have been reconstructed near the entrance to Karnak Temple. Looking into the corners here gives us a clue as to the nature of the powerful tools that must have been used to give these blocks their shape, perhaps running a little too deeply into the material. Other overcuts also demonstrate that again these were most likely circular saws as they fit that profile. They start shallower, they get deeper, and then they become shallower again. Although in some places parts of these cuts are inaccessible due to the addition of modern concrete as part of the reconstruction effort. White calcite, like that used in these chapels, is one of the main stone types that was used by the megalithic builders, along with granite, basalt, and limestone. Calcite is sourced from ancient, and when I say ancient, I mean millions of years ago, natural springs. In order to get white calcite, you have to quarry down to the very center or the source of the ancient spring. As the further out you go, the more impurities end up in the stone, and that results in things like yellow or brown calcite. Calcite is the one that is coming from the core of the spring or from the source. Yeah. And we love to follow this understanding because it's the same case also with other types of stones like granite and the quartzite. They also have chosen the most pure and the best quality of the stone, the most pure quality of the stone. Wherever the source was, the ancient builders must have been able to locate quite a lot of it as white calcite or alabaster is used in large amounts on Old Kingdom sites. 60 to 70 tons of machined calcite was removed from the tunnels and galleries beneath the step pyramid of Djoser at Saqqara and then bulldozed into a berm in modern times. 
In other locations at Saqqara, we can find machined calcite used in the mysterious channeled blocks that typically run beneath the established floor tiles at a lot of the Old Kingdom sites. There's also large blocks of white calcite found at Giza. There's one here up at the end of the causeway in the Mortuary Temple complex, and there's actually megalithic building blocks made of it that are found inside the Valley Temple. White calcite also makes up the floor of the Valley Temple. So wherever you see the combination of granite, limestone, basalt, and calcite, it often coincides with precise megalithic stonework and with the oldest of sites. I have a suspicion that this particular combination of stones was done because it has some sort of functional purpose, and it's perhaps one that resulted in the odd crumbling effect that we can see in a few places. I've done some, let's say, limited testing of the properties of these stones in the past, and I've covered that in a video, but I think this is a field of research that goes much deeper. If you're interested in these topics, I can recommend buying Chris Dunn's new book, Giza, The Tesla Connection when it comes out in early 2024. I've been lucky enough to read an advanced copy as I'm writing an endorsement for it, and I can safely say that it advances the subject of stone functionality to whole new levels. It's amazing work with breathtaking conclusions. The Skirps heads are going to spin after this comes out, and I really do look forward to it. I couldn't show you Karnak without highlighting my favourite example of advanced machining here, and for this we once again return to the granite core structure of the site. In a large block of quarried and split granite, you can find one of the largest tube drill holes I've ever seen in Egypt. It's a monster, around 9 inches in diameter, and made into very hard stone. As with so many other examples of holes from tubular drills, the block has been split down the axis of the hole. I'm convinced that the people who were quarrying these ancient sites for granite pieces would look for these holes, and then using the wedge and chisel approach try to split the block along the axis of the drill hole. This technique obviously works, as you can find examples of split tube drill holes on many other sites like Giza or Saqqara. The sheer size of this tubular drill belies the claim that this was made by some sort of grinding technique with a copper tube and sand. While that grinding method certainly was used to create smaller holes, I'm extremely skeptical that it's possible to achieve holes of this diameter in that manner. Consider the grinding hypothesis for a hole of this diameter. Starting the hole is a huge problem. Even in Mark Lehner and Dennis Stock's experiment that they did for his TV documentary, they had to use a power tool to get the circular hole started in the granite so that the copper tube could be seated in order to begin grinding, although they certainly don't show you that part in the film. How do you suppose you could ever start a 9-inch diameter hole into rose granite? By rubbing on it with sand? I guess you could chisel it in, or you could inset the hole somehow, but we really don't see any evidence for any of that here, and it's not an area that's ever been addressed by experimentalists, and it remains an open question. Although this hole is weathered and worn, you can still feel the grooves and striations on the walls, and that's another indicator that it was likely not made by grinding with a powder or sand. That grinding method leaves a polished surface with if any, only very fine and barely perceptible horizontal scratches. This has been demonstrated by Chris Dunn's experiments, by Dennis Stock's experiments, and by the skeptics' own attempts to debunk Flinders Petrie's claims of a spiral groove. Speaking of that, I've covered the mystery of ancient tube drills in detail in my video on the topic, which is linked below in the description. And if you've seen that video, you'll know that it's not really the size of tube drills that presents a problem for this grinding hypothesis, it's the signature spiral groove that's left behind in the stone. The only piece that's ever been analysed in detail is Flinders Petrie's core number 7 that's housed in the Petrie Museum in London. Petrie first noticed the spiral groove on the core when he found it, and it indicates a remarkable penetration rate into the stone. His findings were conclusively validated by Christopher Dunn and by the Petrie Museum itself with hands-on experiments and geometric analysis of a latex moulding that was made of the core. 
Not for nothing, but these finds were further confirmed by several other people who arranged research appointments with Core Number 7. Chris Dunn's findings seem to have been a very bitter pill to swallow for some skeptics, and I've seen some frankly ridiculous analysis of Core Number 7 trying to undermine them. These debunking attempts are frankly not credible, not just my opinion, but that of several manufacturing engineers that I've spoken to about it. As far as I'm concerned, the case on core number 7 is closed. It's a spiral groove, and you can't obfuscate or bluster your way around the tests that have been done on the actual artifact. They're repeatable, they've been verified, and no matter how much you modify and put pretty colours on photographs, there's no getting around the geometry shown by the latex moulding. That said, I've always wanted to expand the scope of our knowledge in this area, as ultimately we've only ever really examined the one single drill core in any detail. I'm happy to say that some progress has been made here. On a recent trip to Egypt, we did manage to create several high-resolution photogrammetric scans of drill holes that will be analysed. And many thanks to the person who put these together. She knows who she is. These scans of drill holes might reveal some supporting evidence to Flinders Petrie's work. At least to the eye, they certainly contain deep grooves. But time and analysis will tell. Although I was in England in July 2023 and I was hoping to see Petrie's core number 7, unfortunately the Petrie Museum was closed for renovations. But a few of us are making plans to go back to England and hope to use a modern structured light scanner to create detailed scans of several artifacts that are housed there, including vases and also Petrie's core number 7, but also several other drill cores in their collection which at least to the eye, seem to display similar spiral groove markings to core number 7. So, buckle up Skirps, it's going to be a fun ride. If you haven't heard the term before, Skirp is our pet name for some of the sceptics of this work. The same people who can't seem to offer up anything more than weak cries of provenance or fake or sacred geometry is woo when it comes to responding to the truly remarkable findings of our recent pre-dynastic vase scan project. I'd advise said scurps to get a good night's sleep and to prepare for some more angst, because we've been working hard on scanning several more vases in the meantime, and those scans are revealing very similar results to our first scan, and we fully intend to utilise this technique on other ancient artefacts like drill cores in order to expand our knowledge base of the past. Returning to the drill hole at Karnak, there are a couple features here that are worth noting. Firstly, we can see just how thin the tip of the actual tool was, as it left a slight overrun in the stone after the core was removed. Whatever material it was that made this hole, it certainly wasn't copper. Any experiments or even hypotheses involving copper grinding bars or grinding tubes has them, by necessity, quite thick, both because the bar or the tube needs surface area to do the grinding, as it's the sand or the cutting medium that's doing the actual cutting, and because the copper wears away at a similar rate to the stone. So when you see very thin overcuts, only a couple of millimetres thick in this case, it certainly wasn't a copper grinding tube that did this. If you tried to use a very thin copper tool, it would just bend, or it would wear away without any perceptible effect to the granite. It presents a real problem for the mainstream explanation of grinding with copper tools when it comes to the evidence for very thin overcuts, kerfs or thin signatures. Copper won't cut granite on its own. It needs a medium like quartz sand, and it needs surface area to do that, and it needs mass to deal with the fact that the copper of the tool wears away as much as the stone does. I've seen very thin overcuts in tube drills at places like Abu Sir. I showed you some very thin overcuts into granite earlier. I've also observed very thin overcuts as well as thin kerfs on circular saw marks at Abu Sir that I've talked about before made into basalt. Another feature of the Karnak drill hole is the carved circular groove with straight intersections around the top of the hole. Considering this stone block was originally whole and not split in half, this would have been an extremely difficult cut to make into the granite. I do think it might give a clue, however, as to a possible purpose for the hole, which is a question that I've seen often in comments, what were these drill holes for? 
In this case, it might have been a pivot point for an enormous set of doors, with the straight cuts acting as something of a locking position that a mechanism on the door pin could fall into, locking the door at that angle. That idea would necessitate the existence of other holes of similar sizes, but I haven't been able to find them. There are other grooved or striated tube drill holes found at Karnak, some with also very thin overcuts, and some that are in a more complete state. Here's one that's been made into a granite block in the core of the site, and there is another one found on a granite block near the Tefnut statue. There is other evidence for very large tube drill holes being employed. I've seen that in a couple of artifacts in the Cairo Museum, and in this case it looks like they were made into basalt. I've not been able to find this particular example since one of my earliest trips to the museum. I can only hope that it will actually be on display somewhere perhaps in the new Grand Egyptian Museum, which I hope to visit on my next trip to the Eternal Land. Of course, some of the main attractions at both Karnak and Luxor are the epic single-piece granite statues. Immense and regal, they stare down at you as if daring you, a mere mortal, to explain their presence and origin. As mighty as these standing statues at Karnak and Luxor are, and some of these would be in the three to 400 ton range, there's evidence for far larger single-piece statues to be found on these sites. Here, in the boneyard of broken stones at Karnak, we can find part of a chest and neck from a gigantic statue. How was this immense block transported and carved? In another area of the boneyard, workers have been reassembling the pieces for another giant statue, this time made from a single piece of composite quartzite. Originally, just a hand was on display. Now it's been assembled into most of an arm and shoulder, and remarkably, Given that the arm is straight, this was very likely to have been a standing statue, rather than one of a figure seated. The quarry for the quartzite is not specifically known, but it certainly wasn't Aswan, and again we're faced with the mother of all logistical issues when it comes to quarrying and transporting the giant block used for this statue, which likely would have easily exceeded a thousand tons. A close examination of the features of the hand also reveals some interesting aspects. Note the fine work and carving of the thumbnail, obviously an original feature, and then compare it to the relatively crude inscription of the cartouche that's been made into the end of the scroll that the hand is holding. To me, this is obviously the work of primitive hand chisels. Now, as a stone carver, and this is cortisite, conglomerate cortisite, as you can see the flints in it, <coughs> so it's between 7 and 8.5 on the most scale. As a stone carver, I can notice things like the details that is around the cuticle here is amazing. It's the same smooth. And it's as close as that uh, small details that we find in the inscriptions here that dates and relates the statue. The question that I will always ask as a stone carver, why they didn't use the same tools and polishing that they used here <laughs> to finish mm -hmm. the work around the inscriptions here, if they both were made at the same time. Some academics can say that the inscriptions was done by a different person than the carving. I can agree with that, no problem. Still, the, these two stone workers must have similar tools. Like at least, I will be very careful with the inscriptions, as good as the details. So it's quite a stretch to say that the stonemasons who inscribed the glyph on the scroll had access to the same tools as the stonemasons who made the original artifact. Some people will say, well, it was a different person who did the writing, as if it was somehow the scribe's job to carve stone. Consider it. Imagine you're very good at calligraphy or at drawing. Do you really think those skills translate to carving immensely hard stone? If you think it does, then please, by all means, try it. What actually happens is that the scribe or the artist will come and paint or draw the glyphs onto the stone, and then it's the stonemason's job to carve them. 
If this was all done at the same time, then it would be the same stonemason, with presumably the same tools as those that were used to carve the artifact itself. How then can we explain the obvious difference in quality between the carving of the artifacts and the work of the writing? You can't unless you open your mind to the possibility of longer timelines, different tools and different technologies being used. What's more, in this case of this large statue at Karnak, quartzite can be considered even harder to work than granite as it contains nodules of flint, which is typically the stone that's used to carve granite. You can see them here in pieces of this statue, yet running your hand over the smooth surface of the stone, there's no perceivable difference in finish. Clearly, whatever tool shaped the rock had no difficulty in working the flint, and it's quite amazing. I find it hard to convey the majesty of what these immense statues must have looked like in their original condition. And we know that there were many of them, not just at Karnak or in the Luxor region, but as far north as Tanis, some 1,000 miles away in the delta. I've explored this topic in detail in my video on the gigantic single-piece granite statues of Egypt, the link to that is below. When I think about the millennia of time that these artifacts have stood silent, perhaps broken yet still daunting, I'm reminded of Percy Shelley's poem Ozymandias, telling of a desert explorer who, living in centuries past, came upon these mighty ruins. I met a traveller from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. No thing besides remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. It's not just granite or quartzite that some of these statues are made from either. At Karnak, there is a broken statue made from dolerite. You might recognize the name of this stone, I've certainly said it plenty of times before, as this is the material the infamous pounding stones are made from. This is how they made them, apparently. Mm-hmm. Watch out your brackets. <laughs> the tools said to have been used to dig out the intractable granite of the famous Aswan quarry. The only tool needed, apparently, to shape and extract a 1,200 tonne obelisk. One might wonder, what was used to carve the carver? This dolerite statue is very well made and finished. It reminds me of other Old Kingdom examples, like the famous Khafre Enthroned in the Cairo Museum, which is made from diorite, another stone that is harder than granite. Perhaps this dolerite statue has been on this site for far longer than we think, but I guess if Ramses had his name carved into it, he must have had it made, right? Case closed, I guess, and we can just ignore all of these pesky technological issues. Speaking of pesky technological issues, in some of my earlier videos, I've covered the aspects of precision and symmetry that are found on some of these ancient Egyptian statues, as well as the evidence for multiple names being inscribed on them, or the evidence for glyphs being carved over pre-existing features. So do check out those videos if you haven't seen them. Although there's been a lot of renovation work that's happened here, for example, the great head, the Ramses head that Chris Dunn examined in his book, the same one that I took a look at in 2015, was once on the ground in front of the Luxor temple. It's since been restored to the top of a reformed statue. Despite all of this reconstruction work, there are still a few very interesting aspects that can be seen at eye level. One such example is this headjet or this crown here at Luxor. This is also a class of artifacts that I've examined in previous videos. If you can, and this is without getting a whistle blown at you, run your hand over the perfectly finished surface of the stone. It's utterly remarkable. There is no perceivable deviation or imperfection. It's a true masterpiece of ancient engineering. There are a couple of these headjets to be seen in the main courtyard at Luxor, and here's another one that Yusuf and I always like to show people. 
So in order to try and bring this video to a conclusion, let me illustrate something that I've noticed at Luxor Temple over time. In the corner of the courtyard that contains several large standing statues, you might notice something that looks just a little bit off. These statues are surrounded by the typical sandstone columns, made from stacked blocks, and it's certainly dynastic work. But look closely. The spacing between the columns around a couple of these statues looks just a little off, and it certainly is. The statue isn't centered between the columns. Or is it the case that the columns were not spaced evenly around the statues? The same thing can be observed at another statue. It's off-center between the sandstone columns. Consider the possibility that some of these artifacts, perhaps the statues, were in fact older, as we most certainly know some of them were. After all, even Ramses II was recycling the single-piece granite columns on this site, perhaps because he lacked the ability to make them. Could this sandstone infrastructure have been built up around the existing statues and columns? I don't see any reason to rule out this possibility. I think it's likely that the great works of the New Kingdom and Ramses were done to encompass, claim, perhaps even to restore a far older structure. Ultimately, I think this is the takeaway from these huge and ancient sites. As old as they are, and having been worked on over thousands of years in the Middle and New Kingdoms, in their granite cores and in their lower layers, there's a similarity and connection to the type of mysterious megalithic architecture found on Old Kingdom sites, and a shared technological conundrum with logistical challenges, machining marks, and precise stonework. None of that, however, takes anything away from the incredible achievements made here in later periods by the powerful kings and queens of the Middle and New Kingdoms. The soaring heights of the hyperstyle halls, intricate artwork and colour, and sheer scope of the work that was done thousands of years ago by our ancestors simply takes your breath away. None of it should be missed should you ever find yourself visiting the fascinating ancient treasure trove of Luxor. Our knowledge of many of the artifacts and aspects of these remarkable sites would I think benefit from future work and analysis using modern techniques like 3D scanning and modeling in order to deepen our understanding of their creation. Even if the results of such investigation present challenging dilemmas to our current understanding of the history of human civilization, I think that any open-minded archaeologist, researcher or interested person should be in favor of using all of our capabilities to learn more about these sites no matter where the evidence leads. Thanks for watching.
Shut up. 